Offensive line performance and experience. Injuries at Notre Dame, Michigan, and Tennessee, plus other news and notes from across college football after the stinger. Hello and welcome to episode 28 of Good Morning College Football. I am Nicholas Ian Allen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, brought to you, of course, by CampusToCanton.com, where uh, we would very much uh, love your support if you're interested in a wide range of content, uh, including uh, written pieces on the site, uh, a wide range of information, data, tools, all kinds of good stuff for the uh, C2C brand of college football. Uh, you can find that for as little as $2.99 per month at campuscan.com. Uh, and then we have a wide range of membership uh, options, tiers that go all the way up to our C2C Winning Edge and all 22 packages. And that includes a lot of the work that I do each day. Uh, returning production is a big piece of that. We'll talk a little bit about that in depth today as far as offensive lines and uh, what some of the best performing units from last season are compared to who's coming back this uh, this upcoming year. And then also um, our uh, next big to-do uh, piece of our uh, uh, off-season to-do list is our team profiles. So uh, that's the the biggest, most in-depth project that I work on each and every year. We've been doing it since 2018. Uh, and the only place where you're going to be able to get it is uh, campustocanton.com. So we absolutely would love if you would check us out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Also, please give this video a like, and uh, we very much appreciate, appreciate your support, uh, you know, subscribing to the Campus to Canton YouTube channel. But uh, one thing that I wanted to say sort of before we get started talking about our, our team profiles, uh, and I touched on, if you joined us on Monday, uh, what right now, as we're working through, uh, we've still got about a, a little over a month until we expect to be able to publish those team profiles. But uh, we think we have a, a pretty good handle on our top 10 as far as our team strength our, uh, team strength power rankings go. Uh, and we outlined those top 10 teams, mentioned a few that were uh, in the mix. There's certainly plenty of time for teams to uh, you know, add players to the transfer portal, injuries, something we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, that could have an impact on those rankings by the time we kick off for the season officially. But um, I'm always interested to see you know, how folks react to uh, things we talk about on this show, you know, regardless of of uh, what it is, and had a, a member reach out uh, on Monday, uh, specifically uh, someone who's definitely very in tune with college football as a whole. We've got uh, uh, just a great uh, group of members who know a ton about uh, the game and and teams across college football, but specifically, uh, you know, most of you out there probably know your favorite team much better than I do. And so uh, this particular member is a, a you know, longtime Florida State uh, affiliated person and, and uh, had some uh, input on uh, sort of the numbers that I mentioned as far as where FSU's uh, roster strength numbers look on the defensive side of the football specifically. And, and something that I don't think I considered before I was uh, going through the show uh, the other day, but um, uh, those roster strength numbers, I, I probably should have been a little bit more careful because we are still uh, in the pretty early stages and, and those rankings uh, still encompass, uh, you know, teams that are going to be replacing a lot of key players and, and just haven't made those uh you know, those moves fully yet. So I said Florida State uh, was right now, you know, 34th, something like that in, in uh, defensive roster strength. And um, that seemed a little low and it seemed a little low to our, our listener, our member as well. Um, and it probably is, it, it, you know, once all is said and done, I mean, there are plenty of, uh, you know, group of five teams, especially that put up a lot of production towards the end of last season that was able to improve those roster strength numbers. A team like Troy comes to mind immediately. So they're going to be, you know, ranked ahead of Florida State. But 
that Troy defense lost a lot of key players uh, and some other teams as well. So uh, Florida State's probably, I would expect, going to be, you know, a top 25, top 20 team as far as defensive uh, roster strength goes by time uh, the season starts. But we don't know for sure. They could uh, certainly end up, uh, you know, getting into that top 20, especially if they add a, you know, a piece or two here or there. Uh, but uh, just something that that I think I probably uh, skimmed over a little too much or too quickly, I should say, while I was uh, going through the information on Monday. So keep that in mind. Anytime, you know, we're, we're sharing, especially something that is a work in progress and basically everything we do at CFP Winning Edge is always a work in progress. So uh, keep in mind that that uh, those numbers may change and things may get updated. And, and with that in mind, we're actually going to talk a little bit about the offensive line situation at, at uh, some key teams, uh, specifically Power 5 teams, as we look ahead to 2024. And uh, uh, you know, a couple of posts caught my eye. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with Parker Fleming at Stats of War on Twitter. Does a lot of great work uh, with stats, has for a long time, has access to some great information and, and shares a lot of uh, you know charts and tables and lists um, just of, of uh, very, very useful college football information. And one caught my eye from a few days ago where uh, he posted about uh, there's only one Power 5 team that averaged more than three yards before contact on designed running plays in 2023. That was UCF, which averaged 3.54 way, way, way ahead of the number two team on the list, which was Miami, followed by Kansas, Tennessee, LSU, Georgia Tech, USC, Georgia, Kansas State, and Oklahoma State. Uh, so that got me to, to thinking, all right, so it's only one piece of information, but it's a valuable piece of information, right, as far as uh, run offense goes and, and how well, uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to uh, really evaluate. And for a long time, especially in college football, we haven't been able to put very many numbers uh, to, you know, performance on the offensive line. So uh, this is a great one. You know, how, how long does it take before a running back is touched? Uh, and of course, the, the longer it takes, three and a half yards, UCF did a great job for its uh, offensive line as far as creating, uh, you know, push up front, giving those running backs an opportunity to run. So uh, this is a, a you know type of number uh, that I try to get my hands on when I can and, and incorporate that into something that we've been doing for several years at, at CFP Winning Edge is our offensive line performance rating. So, uh, you know, collegefootballdata.com does uh, great work. Of course, you know, PFF has offensive line grades and, and those can be very, very valuable. Um, so, you know, I'll try to find information where I can throw it into you know, the, the databases that I've built over the, the uh, you know, since we started this in, in 2018 compare how those numbers look for the current season where we are, but also, you know, during that three to five to, to seven, you know, whatever window we end up setting, usually I try to keep it around five uh, years, but uh, put that all together, you know, sort it, see how it all shakes out and uh, try to put a number very similar to all the other numbers that we use same scale for our you know player ratings our team performance ratings coach ratings uh, all that good stuff but to to try to you know say how well is this offensive line performing so um I, I went and looked at this particular group this this offensive line group and not surprisingly most of these teams that uh, parker outlined as being uh, among the best in this you know one particular uh stat did uh, you know, rank pretty highly in our uh, offensive line performance ratings from 2023. UCF was number 11 nationally uh, in, in O-line performance. That includes, you know, run defense stats. It also includes, or run uh, offense stats. It also includes, um, you know, passing, uh, you know, how well a team uh, is able to protect the quarterback. We look at things like you know, pressure rate and, and stuff like that as well. Um, Miami was number eight. Kansas, number three. They topped out the, the group on this list. Uh, Tennessee, somewhat surprisingly, uh, was on the, the low end. They were 91st in our O-line performance numbers, uh, which it is anytime we do O-line performance or team performance or, or any stats that we reference 
uh, we usually try to keep it to uh, regular season only and FBS opponents only. So I'm not sure exactly. I know Parker usually filters for garbage time and, and FBS opponents only and things like that. Uh, so that's probably the case, but I, I might have missed if he uh, outlined specifically uh, you know, where this number came and in what scenarios and whatnot. But uh, just something to, to keep in mind. Anyway, uh, LSU was number five. Uh, Georgia Tech, 27th. USC, number 10. Georgia, number four. Kansas State, 44. And Oklahoma State, 98. But of course, Oklahoma State had, uh, you know, arguably the best running back in college football and Ollie Gordon, especially uh, after he got himself established after the first few weeks of last season. And uh, that, uh, that Oklahoma State offensive line is in uh, a really rare sort of unique position, at least relative to these, uh, you know, top 10 teams that, that Parker put together here, uh, because basically everybody is back <laughs> for Oklahoma State up front. Uh, that is not the case for any other unit that was outlined here. In fact, if we're looking at, you know, percentage of snaps returning in our uh, returning production database, which if you want to look at all 134 FBS teams, uh, we, we do have uh, those percentages available on one page. And we also have team pages that outline, you know, uh, where where people are, are coming back um, and, and who's leaving, who's who's back. But uh, the, the next highest uh, percentage of returning snaps among offensive linemen was LSU at 34. Uh, they're at 76 and a quarter percent, according to our calculations, our understanding of, of who's coming back, who's not. Uh, Georgia was the only other team ranked in the top 40. Uh, they are at 73.5%. Um, uh, Georgia Tech is 40th. Uh, uh, so I guess Georgia and Georgia Tech, the only two to other top 40 teams. Uh, Miami, 52nd on this list. And then it gets to be, you know, below FBS average. Tennessee, 77th. Uh, USC 80th, uh, Kansas and UCF 92nd and 93rd respectively, and then Kansas State on uh, you know the, the far uh, low end at 112th with a, a returning snap percentage, uh, if, if our numbers are correct, of 35.5%. We also break it down by you know the starts coming back. Uh, Oklahoma State brings back basically every start, if, if our numbers are correct. Uh, the numbers don't change a whole lot. The, the rankings are going to be in a very similar you know, spot among uh, the, that one, one through 134, if you just look at snaps versus starts. But, uh, you know, LSU is, is now top 30 in its stats, or excuse me, starts returning on the offensive line. They're 29th, uh, Georgia Tech 35th, Georgia 42nd, uh, and K-State still down at the, the bottom of, of this group at 112. Uh, but we also include, you know, offensive line snaps coming in through the transfer portal and offensive line starts coming in through the transfer portal. And uh, three teams on this list, we don't have any, uh, and, and this references uh, FBS starts for the most part. There are a few FCS uh, starters and and. Uh, performers where their snaps have been incorporated into our returning production database. We are continuing to add those as we work on uh, our team profiles and things like that. But as of right now, we're not, uh, don't have any snaps or starts added for LSU, USC, or Georgia. Everybody else has brought in somebody with some experience. Uh, on the high end of that is uh, Miami. Uh, we also have UCF. So, you know, even though UCF ranks pretty low as far as who's actually just coming back from last year. They have been aggressive, adding 16.5% based on last year's numbers of uh, snaps coming in this year. Georgia Tech is also added, so they uh, you know, uh, bring back a pretty experienced unit, but are, are continually uh, adding to that group, trying to make it as good as it can possibly be. Uh, and K-State has good, done some good work, so they've sort of you know, balanced out uh, that uh, you know level of uh, experience lost by bringing in uh, some experience, and an FCS starter is is among the group there. Uh, transfer coming in from North Dakota, but uh, just just you know something that that perhaps is interesting to note. We have have mentioned offensive line returning production in the past. We've 
updated those numbers since they were first published in February. And we try to keep, uh, you know, anytime we get new information, anytime we can add a little bit more to it as far as those, uh, you know, really experienced uh, FCS uh, impact performers who are going to come in, have, you know, multiple years starting experience or a full year of starting experience, as is the case with, uh, you know, one particular player at, at K-State, but there are others uh, certainly worth noting as well. We try to capture those. Um, but, I, I, you know, all these numbers are available in our returning production database. Uh, these particular offensive, offensive line specific ones, the, the performance numbers are in our team profiles or 2023 team profiles, but the snap starts uh, returning and added or on the returning production database, but I put all these in one Excel file and, and I'll post that in our Campus to Canton Discord. So uh, that'll be in the, the CGC Winning Edge tier, but you know you can sort by, all right, offensive line performance ratings and then look at the you know color coding, how well did the, uh, these, these uh, units rank uh, compared to, to what's coming back. And, and you'll see pretty quickly that a team like Georgia and LSU uh, pretty pretty rare as far as being a top five team in offensive line performance, uh, but then also still you know in the green as far as their experience numbers go, uh, being in the top you know thirty five or, or forty uh, in, in snaps returning. Oregon's actually in a, a pretty good spot. They're only fifty first in O line snaps returning, but that's still uh, you know better than than FBS average. So uh, worth noting there. Boston College pretty decent. Uh, combination. Uh, so Oregon was number two in our line performance last year. Uh, Boston College is uh, was number 13. They took a huge jump after being one of the worst offensive lines in the country in 2022. Uh, graded out pretty well there. And they've also got some experience coming back. They're top 60 uh, in uh, both snaps and starts returning um, at the G5 level. Keep an eye on a team like Louisiana, uh, who ranked 16th in our O-line performance numbers, and they're uh, right around the top 25 in both starts and snaps returning, according to our current numbers. Arizona's in a pretty good spot, top 20 across the board. Um, they're a team that we'll touch on here a little bit later. Texas top 20 across the board. Um, you know, that that running back situation there, uh, losing Jonathan Brooks, who was excellent, but a very talented group coming back. Uh, CJ Baxter, Jaden Blue uh, headlining that group. So, you know, they they seem to be in a pretty good spot. Uh, but then, you know, you look on the, the offensive lines who graded out really, really well, but rank on the extreme low end as far as, uh, those returning production numbers. Um, our number one unit last year, uh, UTEP, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, but uh, ended up as our top O-line performance uh, unit last season, but they rank 128th in offensive line snaps returning. A lot of transition there uh, under new head coach Scotty Walden. But a team like Washington uh, really, really struck out, you know, stuck out to me when I went through and updated their uh, team profile for 2024. And offensive line is always tricky, right? I mean, it's it's difficult for high school talent evaluators, uh, you know, to, to, the, the folks at uh, 247 Sports and On3 and Rivals all do a really, really good job of scouting players and projecting. And that's why, uh, you know, we, we look to those numbers as basically the key building block in uh, building our individual player ratings, our video game ratings. Uh, but the offensive line is just harder than any other position most would, would tell you. And as far as projecting guys from high school to college to the NFL, see a lot of, you know, uh, the, a lot of the, the or maybe not a lot, I don't know, maybe I am, am too uh, flippant with that as a term, but, you know, you, you do see some first line or uh, first round offensive linemen uh, who maybe started their career as a tight end or something like that. So, you know, that position, there seems to be uh, things that are just a little bit more common uh, where a guy maybe slipped through the cracks of the uh, recruiting uh, industry and and uh, then develops really quickly, grows, puts on huge weight, you know, uh, adds athleticism or is able to stay athletic if they, you know, uh, grow into an offensive tackle body, something like that. Um, 
it's it's just tough, right? So it, it's tough to evaluate offensive lines, and and uh, uh, we try to to do the best we can with these performance numbers. But anyway, that's that's me trying to set this up uh, to to not necessarily be offensive in the way I was uh, going to bring up this Washington offensive line unit. But I, I built the you know uh, the depth chart projection uh, a, a few days ago, and on paper, just on paper. Uh, that was that the Washington offensive line, um, is you know, it, it compares to some of the uh, well below FBS average group of five type units, at least the way that we calculate it right now. So, um, you know, Washington's offensive line was a major reason why uh, that team clicked like it did played their way into uh, a, a national championship game right and and on the field they were seventh in our o-line performance ratings but they are 134th in offensive line snaps returning just 3.1 percent of snaps returning and they've added some through the transfer portal uh particularly got a transfer from uh, San Diego State, uh, who who is you know penciled into one of those offensive line spots, most likely Drew as a party uh, was a, a, a six game starter for the Aztecs last year. Um, but uh, you know, looking at the the individual uh, player ratings, unit ratings, um, this this offensive line is probably going to grade out as like a uh, you know 80th, 90th, something like that. Um, so anyway. We we put together uh, some of these units, some of these numbers. How you can s- compare how it performed on the field according to our uh, grades and, and the numbers that we emphasize, but then also uh, how much of that production is coming back. And and you know, Oklahoma State, Ollie Gordon run game, running offensive line, excellent, excellent uh, numbers last year. Little work to do, perhaps, uh, in the, the the passing side of things. But um, among the, the very, very uh, extreme high end as far as returning production numbers go. So uh, anyway, put these numbers together in a spreadsheet. I'll drop them in uh, our uh, Discord, the C2C Winning Edge uh, tier uh, channels there. And with that, we'll sort of turn our attention to some spring practice updates. Um, And, uh, you know, speaking of that USC offensive line, they were a unit that graded out quite well last year, little on the low end, below FBS average, and a lot of those snaps returning. They're also going to be without a potential starter, somebody in the mix, uh, that's Gino uh, Quinones, who will be out this spring along with uh, tight end Lake McCree, safety Zion Branch, uh, RJ Ab- uh, Abadia of uscfootball.com passed along a quote from head coach Lincoln Riley earlier this week that was outlining, uh, you know, those three players in particular, but also, you know, the offensive line uh, among uh, and, and this was a piece, you know, that the three takeaways from the first week of spring practice thought it was kind of interesting what Riley said about the tackle position, quoting here, uh, the quality at tackle is good, but the depth is a little bit of a concern right now. There's certainly a possibility that we may look to add somebody there. Obviously, uh, we'll just see how spring unfolds. Some of these young guys are going to get a ton of reps, guys like Tobias Raymond and Justin uh, to a new who just got here because of the depth, they'll get a million reps and it'll be fun to see them progress right now. Elijah page and Mason Murphy would certainly be the first two in there, but um, you know, kind of sandwiched there in the middle of that quote was uh, USC is probably a, a place that if given the opportunity, we'll, we'll add some depth at the tackle position uh, through the transfer portal. So keep that in mind when that window opens here uh, a little bit later, but speaking about those three uh, players who are going to be out this spring, all of whom uh, either are projected starters or, you know, potential uh, projected starters. Riley said, quote, uh, expect them all to be full go or close to full go for fall camp. Lake, talking about tight end McCree, uh, will probably, just because his injury was later than the others, he'll probably be the latest one, but he's way ahead, so he'll definitely get a shot. Uh, He's definitely got a shot to certainly be a participant and hopefully a full participant in spring camp. Uh, the other two certainly 
will be. So uh, good, no, good news there for uh, that offensive line unit as it looks to rebuild from last year's success uh, that Keonis is uh, perhaps going to be back in, in full speed by the fall, even if he is missing the spring. A few other uh, injury uh, updates here. Uh, Michigan and Notre Dame both got some bad news in the secondary in recent days. Uh, Matt Zenitz uh, first reported that Michigan safety Rod Moore suffered a torn ACL in practice earlier this week. And, and uh, Rod Moore, one of uh, you know relatively few major uh, impact returners for Michigan. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, he had uh, 34 total tackles uh, last year, a, a tackle for loss, a couple of picks. Uh, three pass breakups, um, and somebody who was a returning starter uh, for the Wolverines on uh, that national championship team. So uh, you would expect that more suffering a torn ACL in late March. Uh, that's probably going to sideline him for, uh, you know, most of the season, I, I would expect. Uh, he was one of three returning starters in the secondary alongside Will Johnson and Makari Page, but I expect that looks like Quentin Johnson probably uh, would would step up, uh, Quentin Johnson, I should say, and, and be that free safety starter full time. Uh, but that's a unit you know, despite a, a little bit of experience, relatively speaking, uh, you know, only one other full-time starter from last year's defense. Uh, Mason Graham is is expected back. There's, there's you know, Michigan rotated a lot of guys in, so uh, there's still a lot of talent there expected to be a you know, top 10 uh, defense as far as those roster strength numbers go. But um, without Rod Moore, uh, you know that that that's going to be uh, a, a big loss. Uh, another team that uh, sounds like you know maybe not quite as bad of news, uh, but Notre Dame, who we expect to be a top five team in our preseason power rankings, uh, their playmaking cornerback Benjamin Morrison is going to be shut down for the rest of spring practice due to shoulder surgery. So Morrison was a freshman All-American in 2022, uh, has nine interceptions over the last uh, two seasons, double-digit pass breakups. Um, he uh, has undergone uh, the surgery already, so like quarterback Riley Leonard, he's going to miss the rest of spring, but it does sound like um, he should be you know, back for the season. We'll, we'll definitely you know, sideline him for a while, but um, I, I, if I understand the reporting correctly, Morrison is is uh, not in as nearly as much danger to miss a, a big chunk of the season. Uh, but something certainly to to watch, especially uh, with Notre Dame, you know, being one of those teams that looks like a, a potential playoff team. Uh, and he certainly is one of the the best players on that defense, which we did mention. We do expect to be, you know, a top three top five uh, team as far as roster strength goes. So take Morrison out of the mix and, and they far, probably fall a spot or two. Uh, but uh, hopefully he will be back and, and fully healthy. A few other injury notes. And, and unfortunately, they're talking more injuries today than we have maybe at any point so far this spring. But at Rutgers, uh, head coach Greg Schiano has said that Tyreen Powell, who uh, suffered an injury toward the end of last season, Linebacker has been a starter, been very productive. Uh, sadly, has torn his Achilles. Um, says he is expected to uh, be back for the start of the 2024 season. Um, Achilles are, are just uh, I mean, brutal. I can't imagine. Um, but uh, we, we something to keep an eye on there. Uh, unfortunately, Rutgers has had a lot of its best linebackers uh, rotating in and out of uh, availability because of injuries. And, and that's been a, you know, an area that really looks like a strength uh, for Rutgers on, on paper, but just they haven't been able to, to keep that unit fully healthy all at the same time each of the last couple of years. So Powell uh, would be a big, you know, big loss if he is going to be sidelined for any significant time in the fall. Sounds like uh, Shiano expects him back, but um, certainly something to keep an eye on there. 
In South Carolina, Shane Beamer said that uh, running back Juju McDowell is going to be shut down for the rest of the spring uh, to help a collarbone injury heal. Uh, Beamer also previously indicated, I think we mentioned this before, that Rocket Sanders, the incoming transfer from Arkansas, uh, as well as linebacker Mokaba, uh, redshirt freshman CJ Adams, are all likely to miss the entirety of spring. Uh, there's depth at that running back position for South Carolina, but uh, they're down you know, two experienced members there with McDowell and Sanders uh, sidelined this spring. At West Virginia, a few key players are going to be limited tight end Cole Taylor, uh, junior running back CJ Donaldson. Uh, Christopher Hall of Mountaineers now outlined that Taylor had an off-season surgery, uh, but is expected to be, uh, you know, out for spring practice, out on the field, I should say, uh, not fully dressed, not fully participating in, in contact drills or, or anything like that. But, uh, you know, not not just standing off to the side either. So that's somewhat good news. Uh, Donaldson, uh, he said, had a surgery prior to the bowl game, uh, will progress as the team goes through spring. Uh, he also outlined some other areas that are seemingly quite impacted by injury for West Virginia, multiple defensive linemen, multiple linebackers, multiple offensive linemen uh, are out uh, due to injuries this spring. Uh, one thing I failed to mention uh, when talking about Rutgers, they, they've also had a, uh, a, a trio of medical retirements this week, including a couple offensive linemen, not, not very experienced guys, but were among the higher uh, you know, rated recruits a, a couple of years ago. So uh, a little bit of uh, a hit to depth there for Rutgers as they look to build on last season's winning campaign. Got to a bowl game and uh, beat Miami there uh, to cap it all off. Uh, finishing up here for the injuries, uh, Florida State coach Mike Norvell uh, announced uh, several players, including a couple of uh, starters are expected to, to compete for starting uh, spots. Defensive tackle Joshua Farmer, Offensive tackle Robert Scott are both uh, missing uh, spring. Uh, they are expected back for preseason for fall camp. Um, and then Jamari Howard, a, a true freshman, uh, is out for the rest of spring and probably going to uh, be sidelined a little bit in the fall as well. Um, and just before we got started here today, a little bit of breaking news. Austin Price of Volquest uh, reported that uh, Tennessee running back Cam Seldon is going to miss the rest to spring practice with a shoulder injury. So that's uh, certainly a, a bummer for uh, Selden, who is a favorite at Campus to Canton. Uh, just a lot of the you know, numbers grayed out incredibly, incredibly well from an athleticism standpoint. I know he's somebody that uh, the recruiting team was super impressed with, and he was going to be competing with Dylan Sampson for reps this spring um and and unfortunately selden's uh, going to be going to be sidelined so samson probably uh now should should if he wasn't already expected to be the clear uh starter at running back for the balls uh this year hopefully selden will be back and, and healthy in the fall we shouldn't count a guy out uh for for missing the spring but a little bit of uh, bad timing, missed opportunity there, potentially. Uh, a few transfer notes, and we're going to have, I'm sure, many more of these as we uh, get closer and closer to that uh, transfer window opening up. Uh, a potential starting quarterback is in the transfer portal. Blake Murphy uh, announced on uh, Twitter earlier this week, uh, got some starting experience last year for the Warhawks, but announced that as a redshirt freshman uh, is entering the transfer portal this spring. So something of note there, I probably would have had Murphy penciled in as the expected starter at ULM. He was the leading uh, returner in basically every passing category, I believe. Um, so new look coaching staff there at ULM and, you know, they have started spring practice. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the details as, as to what led Murphy to um, this decision, whether he had fallen behind in the pecking order or, you know, maybe he had uh, heard whispers of uh, other bigger opportunities out there to, you know, I, I, I don't have any particular insight on it, but Murphy was somebody that uh, impressed me a little at times. I know from a CFF standpoint, I uh, added him in, in a couple of deeper dynasty leagues, just, you know, based on some of that experience as a, a true freshman last year. So perhaps a, a name to file away, keep an eye on uh, to see where he ends up uh, at LSU. 
uh, Gio Paez, who is a uh, part-time starter at Wisconsin uh, as an interior defensive lineman, uh, was a defensive end at, at Wisconsin uh, in their 3-4 uh, uh, base, uh, made 22 tackles, uh, 13 games last season. Uh, he's listed at 6'3", 310. Um, like I said, seven game starter, uh, basically a, a part-time starter for the Badgers, but, uh, a lot of experience and size, which is much needed for LSU. Uh, one area of particular, um, you know, lack of experience and experience for the Tigers this year in that unit that really, really needs to take a step in the right uh, direction. Uh, adding uh, Paez is, is uh, you know, certainly going to help that a uh, big body and, and add some depth there as well. Uh, at Indiana, Trey Lang has one year of eligibility, uh, but it will uh, be played out elsewhere, not with the Hoosiers. He also announced that um, on Twitter a couple of days ago. A uh, couple of G5 uh, notes, Appalachian State finished up their spring practice and uh, not long after a couple of experienced defensive linemen entered the transfer portal. Former D-line starter DeAndre Dingle Price uh, and a contributor Keevan Hagler uh, both announced their intentions earlier this week. And then uh, on sort of the other side of things, when UMass started its spring practice, uh, looked like three or four potential two deep contributors entered the transfer portal there. So uh, we will have plenty, plenty more news, I'm sure, uh, as uh, it comes out as far as other teams across college football who you know, whether they're players who see themselves maybe getting squeezed out during spring practices or um, some that, uh, you know, get get wind of uh, another opportunity elsewhere. Um, there'll be a lot of moving pieces later this uh, later next month uh, for sure. On to the uh, tri or, uh, the uh, updates side of things the, the practice updates at washington state an offense of particular interest to uh, folks that play college fantasy football of course very prolific uh passing offense we talked a little bit about the quarterback competition uh jared palmgren and i a couple of weeks ago on chasing the natty um and we know who took the first quarterback rep of spring it was uh john mateer that's according to jamie vinnick of coogfan uh, Mateer, uh, according to Vinix notes, um, was dialed in, completed 16 of 21 passes during a, a particular section of practice that, that he was able to view that included nine straight completions to start the day. Uh, so, you know, I don't know exactly what to, uh, what what drills those were, you know, 7-on-7, 11-on-11, seven seven, 11 11, whatever. But um, the, the media in... Uh, in the building was impressed with Mateer's start. Uh, and he does enter as the most uh, tenured Washington state quarterback. Uh, but as we mentioned, uh, there is a, an FCS uh, former starter who is going to be competing in Zevi Eckhaus, uh, took all of the reps with the number twos, according to Vinick, went 11 for 16, according to his uh, charting, uh, did have uh, a, a long touchdown early in the practice, but um, perhaps, uh, you know, one of the, the things that's most important beyond just the quarterbacks, uh, this wide receiver group and who's going to step up and, and, you know, be in line for a highly productive role, especially in uh, the you know slot position is uh, key. And so folks are, are definitely keeping an eye on what's the pecking order there at wide receiver. Uh, this again, according to Vinick's notes at the X position, Carlos Hernandez was the starter uh, with Trey Shackelford uh, incoming transfer behind him. Uh, at the H, it was Josh Meredith with Brandon Hills, number two in line. Uh, the Y position was Chris Hudson, followed by Tony Freeman. And at the Z, Kyle Williams uh, with Leon Neal getting those number two reps. Uh, the, the tight end group sounded like was uh, Cooper Mathers getting uh, the, the first team reps and then a rotation of others uh, there behind him. But a few notes from uh, a few quotes, I should say, from head coach Jake Dickert prior to uh, spring practice beginning on Monday. These also coming from Vinick of, of Um 
uh, Dickert said, quote, we need to have Kyle Williams take his game to the next level. Kyle Williams is a popular uh, pick in uh, CFF circles. Um, that That's what he's focused on as a veteran leader. Carlos Hernandez has probably made the biggest jump as a freshman last year to now getting into where he's going to go through his second spring after being a mid-year enrollee. He was a buzzy name last year as a true freshman. And, you know, perhaps even buzzier this year, uh, expecting a bigger role. Josh Meredith has elevated his game tremendously. And he's a name that perhaps is flying a little under the radar, but uh, was mentioned in that, you know, first practice wrap up piece uh, from Vinick. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, so maybe a name to look at there. Uh, Chris Hudson, the, the transfer from Oregon, former starter in 2022, kind of fell off a little bit uh, last season. Uh, I think there might have been an injury involved there, but um, uh, Dickert had some uh, something to say about him as well. Quote, I'm excited to see Chris Hudson. He's got all the tools. Kyle Maxwell, Trey Shackelford. It's time to really see these guys in action. Maxwell, who all three of those uh, players are incoming transfers, but Maxwell coming from uh, Louisiana Tech uh, will be limited in spring ball with a minor groin injury, according to uh, to uh, Vinick. So something to, to keep an eye on there in a prolific offense that uh, will be playing a little bit softer schedule this season as a you know kind of pseudo uh, member of the Mountain West uh, following the the. You know, Pac-12 uh, distribution uh, elsewhere that we saw. On that note, Arizona and Arizona State, former Pac-12 uh, rivals uh, of the Cougs, now both headed to the Big 12, uh, got their spring practices started this week. Justin Spears of the Arizona Daily Star had some notes from Wildcats practice where uh, San Jose State transfer Quali Conley uh, was first in the running back team drills. Rayshon Luke, uh, you mentioned, uh, caught a few passes out of the backfield. Of course, you know, the, the quarterback, Noah Fafita, his uh, longtime favorite tight end and, and good friend, I have to assume, uh, longtime teammates, high school teammates, uh, Tech McMillan, uh, were, uh, should, you know, showed while they're considered one of the top quarterback receiver duos in college football, as Spears put it, um, alongside McMillan. Montana Lamonius Craig and uh, Kevin Green Jr. were the starting wide receivers or top you know, first team group, uh, Green being in the slot. Uh, third year receiver A.J. Jones, uh, who was a standout in fall camp last year, uh, made a few impressive grabs uh, in uh, tight windows in traffic, according to Spears. Uh, at Arizona State, Jake Seymour of the Sun Devils uh, source noted some injuries. Uh, we, of course, mentioned that Jaden Rashada is not going to be uh, a fully cleared to practice this spring. He's got a thumb injury that he suffered in a, a moving accident, sounds like. Uh, but uh, senior wide receiver Xavier Gilroy, uh, Gillery, excuse me, uh, who sat out basically the back half of last season due to a foot injury. He apparently is not going to be fully available this spring uh, after surgery. Uh, Jordan Tyson, who uh, sat out all of last season after having a, a great a true freshman campaign at Colorado in 2022. Uh, he apparently did not practice on Tuesday, but according to Seymour, Dillingham said it wasn't a major issue and he's expected back on Thursday. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then uh, Seymour, of course, we're always interested, you know, who's taking those first team reps. Uh, it was Trenton Borgo at quarterback, Cam Scadabo and Kyson Brown splitting reps at running back. At wide receiver, it's Troy O'Meara, Caleb Black, and Noquan Stovall. Uh, there was a report earlier in the week that Elijah Badger is not going to be available. Um, so perhaps that's uh, why that, that wide receiver pecking order is as it is. And then at tight end, it was uh, Bryce Pierre. So early days uh, there in uh, Arizona for both uh, the U of A and ASU, but uh, something that, that we'll definitely be uh, keeping an eye on. Uh, turning our attention uh, to the SEC, we haven't heard much out of Oklahoma uh, so far this spring, and, and partly that sounds like it's because a reporter said their first viewing period on Monday, and Tom Green of Sooners Illustrated was on hand. Uh, he noted a few injury uh, updates where um, 
uh, Gary and Hatchet, one of those wa- uh, Washington outgoing offensive linemen uh, that we alluded to earlier in the show. Uh, he has uh, got a boot on his left foot, so not currently practicing there. Uh, safety Billy Bowman, you know, all-American candidate, uh, one of the best in the country, uh, was dressed out but not participating in drills. He had a, a sleeve on his right leg, according to Green. Um and a few offensive players, uh, perhaps expected to, to be impact performers, tight end Jake Roberts, wide receiver Nick Anderson, wide receiver Gavin Freeman, uh, were all held out of practice uh, and were sidelined, but were in uniform as well. So keep an eye on uh, if and when those those guys are going to be back and, and at full speed this spring. Um, at, uh, you know, how are things progressing at, at what positions? Green noted that the running back rotation uh, was Gavin Sawchuk, followed by Javante Barnes, Caleb Hicks, Sam Franklin, and Amika Megwa. Deep group there. Uh, at tight end, of course, Roberts is out, but Bauer Sharp uh, was getting first team reps and sounds like, according to some other reports I saw, uh, he's really been impressive this spring. So a tight end to, to keep an eye on there. Uh, the uh, wide receiver group um, during that viewing period had uh, Jaden Gibson and Jaleel Farouk on the outside, Dion Burks in the slot uh, with that first team, rounding out that first team group. Uh, the second team was J.J. Hester and Brennan Thompson on the outside with Jacquez, uh, or Jacquez uh, Petaway in the slot. At LSU, we, of course, have to keep an eye on who's that number three wide receiver. Anytime we can get an update, we'll take it. And Zach Nagy uh, was on hand uh, for LSU country, as always. Uh, this is coming from Tuesday's practice. Um, at the running back position, the first, you know, no, no real changes there. Josh Williams still getting those first team reps, but it sounds like he and Caleb Jackson pretty much splitting that role as the only two scholarship running backs available this spring. Uh, at wide receiver, Kyron Lacey, Chris Hilton seemingly have separated themselves as the top two wideouts. Uh, and Aaron Anderson for the second day in a row was taking uh, reps with that group. Uh, so Anderson has, has been that third starting wide receiver the last two practices, according to Nagy. Uh, Cal Parker, who has been impressive at times so far this spring, uh, according to Nagy, remains a player competing uh, alongside C.J. Daniels and Xavier Thomas. Uh, and then he says Parker, Daniels, and Thomas have taken a majority of second team snaps with Shelton Sampson and Kai Prien also entering the mix. So Probably still too early to say uh, if, if things really are kind of shaking out there, but back-to-back days with Anderson being a starting wide receiver. And we haven't yet seen C.J. Daniel, somebody I was particularly pretty high on uh, as a transfer coming up from Liberty. Uh, big play receiver, had great numbers last season, was impressed uh, with with what I saw from him, uh, but at least so far, not not quite able to break through or, or you know take uh, – any significant uh, first team reps so far this spring. So uh, Lacey, Hilton, you know, one and two, one A, two, one A, one B, maybe. Um, but uh, keep an eye on on Anderson, perhaps, as, as uh, maybe making a move to, to lock down that third spot. Uh, at Arkansas, Trey Biddy of Hog Sports reported on the fastball period, which is uh, typically what's a, a pretty good indication of where things stand on the depth chart. This is from uh, earlier this week, uh, Tuesday, on, on the sixth day of spring practice for the Hogs. Um, uh, how did uh, these, these uh, four plays stack up? Uh, the first quarterback, as expected, Taylor Green uh, followed uh, or, or joined by, I should say, running back Jaquindon Jackson. Uh, earlier, I know in, in spring, he was, uh, I think, second uh, in this uh, group. Uh, the outside receivers were Andrew Armstrong and Tyrone Broden. And the inside receiver, uh, Jaden Wilson, tight end Luke Haas, who is back after an early spring injury. Um, but the uh, second group, quarterback Malachi Singleton, uh, running back Isaiah Augustov. Augustov, I always mispronounce his name, my apologies. Uh, Isaac Tesla, Jordan Anthony, and uh, Varkis Gums, and Andreas Paskey, two tight ends in that second group, uh, were, were the uh, uh, players behind. At Mississippi State, 
Uh, we uh, got a, a little bit more news than we have from the first few practices. Robbie Falk of Maroon and White Daily uh, was there for the first media viewing period. It was only about 20 minutes, um, and, and Falk was pretty clear that, you know, didn't get a great look at everybody uh, as a result, but it did seem, you know, Blake Shapen running as the first team quarterback, as expected. Uh, Jeff Levy uh, has, uh, according to Falk, said that he really would like to have a strong idea of the starter by the end of spring. Uh, so don't be shocked if Shapen is named starter uh, before all is said and done this spring in Starkville. Uh, but how is the wide receiver pecking order shaking out? Uh, Falk said, we didn't get a good look at all of the receivers, but Kelly Akiari, the transfer from UTEP, uh, Justin Robinson, and Kevin Coleman, Louisville transfer, uh, were the first three. So the, the first team units there, Creed Whittemore, Stonka Burnside, and Jordan Mosley all worked with the second team. At tight end, it was Sedu Traore uh, a couple of years ago was a breakout performer at Arkansas State, transferred to Colorado last spring, ended up not playing uh, due to uh, eligibility, transferred to, to uh, Mississippi State. But uh, he is atop the uh, tight end depth chart, at least as it appears uh, right now, followed by Cameron Ball uh, in these early days of spring practice. All right, in the last uh, nine or ten minutes here, our team of the day today is Buffalo. So uh, we've we've mostly focused on, not entirely, but mostly focused on a group of five teams in our team of the day. That's because, in part, uh, these teams get a little bit overshadowed. We're not doing the, you know, day-by-day uh, uh, -day practice updates like we tend to do with a team like LSU um, for, you know, the Buffaloes, even the, the San Diego States, uh, other other uh, group of five teams get a little overlooked. So I do like to, to use some time and, and focus on these. Uh, and Buffalo is a team very, very much in transition. The MAC this year looks to be completely wide open, especially with Toledo losing as many players as it did to both the NFL draft out of eligibility and uh, the uh, transfer portal. Dick Finn competing for the uh, starting quarterback role at Baylor. You know Penny Boone we've mentioned uh, in the early days of spring practice at Louisville. So that coupled with uh, you know Miami of Ohio. Uh, never really a, a super sexy team. They're the defending champs and, and you know, got some great news with the return of uh, Brett Gabbert. Uh, hopefully he's back and, and fully healthy. Um, but uh, their returning production numbers have, have slipped a little bit uh, the farther we've gone into the offseason. Uh, our very first edition looked like they were going to be quite high. Uh, they've kind of gone basically back to middle of the pack nationally. Uh, but Buffalo, a team that... Uh, not only is is transitioning at uh, head coach, Mo, uh, Mo Linquist left that role for the Bulls. He is now coaching defensive backs at Alabama. Uh, and Pete Lembo, uh, former special teams coordinator at South Carolina, uh, prior to that, you know, bounced around a bit, but had been a head coach at the FBS level at Ball State, had some success there, was also an FCS head coach. Uh, prior to that, uh, has won a lot. You know, where wherever he's been is uh, you know widely regarded as one of the best special teams uh, coaches in college football. But had an opportunity to become a head coach again. Takes over a Buffalo team that uh, has has underachieved, quite honestly. Um, under Mo Lindquist, I mean, not a hundred percent sure how long his leash might have been had he not already uh, decided to move on. Buffalo was three and nine last season, three and five in MAC play, and they rank 121st in our current uh, overall returning production numbers. That's 11th in the MAC. Uh, they are, you know, equally uh, inexperienced on both offense and defense. They rank 118th in our adjusted offensive returning production numbers, 116th in our adjusted defensive numbers. Um, and uh, Buffalo is, is uh, starting up spring practice. Rachel Lindsay of the Buffalo News uh, had a preview earlier this week, had some quotes from Limbo, uh, who said, you know, you can't necessarily measure, uh, you know, some of that, talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, the things that are that are uh, you know getting the the, the team together, uh, uh, it, 
continuing the quote here, sorry. Uh, but there's value to it in terms of the chemistry and the unity of the team. When we get back from break and get started, helmets will go on, then helmets and shoulder pads, and then obviously full pads. But to me, this is the next step. And some of those big picture things we're trying to accomplish as a team uh, that are going to set us up for success come August and September. So talking about you know off-season workouts, prep, getting ready for spring practice, trying to uh, get a better understanding of who's on the roster, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. Um, and also the spring is, is a time for competition. At the quarterback position, uh, C.J. Agbana is uh, you know the, the likely starter, the most experienced player, but Gunnar Gray and Richie Watts are also in the mix uh, to start to replace Cole Snyder, who has transferred out. He will be uh, at Eastern Michigan this year. Um, but, uh, you know, how how will that quarterback position shake out certainly is something to watch this spring. Not sure that Buffalo is expecting to have a full answer. Uh, but according to Limbo in the piece here, uh, quote, we've been evaluating everything these guys do from a strength and conditioning standpoint, uh, from the different walkthroughs and agility drills that we've been able to do with our strength staff and our coaches evaluating it. We've got a pretty good assessment of all these guys, whether it's the quarterback position or any other position. Uh, but things always change once you get out on the practice field and start competing with pads. Uh, Limbo noted, that there are a couple of areas uh, on the roster where there is some depth. Uh, the interior defensive line is one of those. Uh, George Wolo, one of the most experienced uh, players returning for the Bulls this year. Uh, and the secondary has some experience, has some depth. Uh, the uh, leader there is safety Marcus Fuqua, who had a huge year uh, a couple of years ago, big time uh, interception number. Um, but uh, defensive end and linebacker were two positions that Limbo noted uh, where they're they're pretty thin. Um, quoting here again, I've been doing this for a long time, and you never put the cart before the horse. You trust your eyes once you're out there on the field. You trust what you see on the video after you watch your practices, and ultimately the kids end up seeing the same things as you uh, that you see as a coach. So, um, you know, a lot of change at Buffalo. Uh, a guy in, in Pete Limbo who has experience, has experience in this conference, has experience in the lower levels, even though he's been, uh, you know, a power five coordinator in his uh, most recent uh, career. Uh, but getting more familiar with these players and there are a lot of new players, you know, the, the uh, level of production uh, that Buffalo is is trying to replace is, is significant. Mentioned Agbana is the leading returning uh option at quarterback, but, you know, numbers weren't great in seven games, completed eight of 21 passes. That's 38.1% for 87 yards, a touchdown and two interceptions. That's 4.1 yards per pass attempt. Uh, but Agbana is a, a, a pretty solid runner. Uh, is second on the team as far as returning uh, rushing yards. He had 214 yards on the ground on 51 carries, three touchdowns. That actually leads all returners, was second on the team last season behind uh, top running back Ron Cook Jr. Uh, Cook Jr. is gone out of eligibility. Mike Washington is also gone. He is transferring out. Uh, that leaves uh, Jacquez Barksdale as the leading returning rusher. He had 248 yards and two touchdowns on 52 carries last season. And then beyond that, I mean, there's not really very much at all in terms of, uh, you know, experience from last year's team. Al.J. Henderson only had five carries last year. He was more productive earlier in his career, so he, I expect, will be uh, in the mix there alongside Barksdale. Uh, but the receiver group is uh, basically starting over. I mean, the top four wide receivers are all gone. Marilyn Johnson, the leading uh, wide out as far as you know, catches, yards, and touchdowns, he's transferred out. But Daryl Harding Jr., Booby Curry, Cole Harity are all out of eligibility. Um, not that the numbers were Excellent across the board, but all those guys had you know, at least 23 catches, had at least 294 yards, and all uh, had a touchdown. Uh, you know, Harding and, and Harry had three. Uh, Ron Cook Jr., pretty good receiving. Running back, he is gone. 29 catches, 221, uh, 220 yards, excuse me, and a touchdown. But Nick McMillan, a player who, uh, you know, 
had had a little bit of buzz last spring. Uh, was limited to just seven games last season due to injuries. Retro freshman, uh, but he is the leading turning returning receiver with 13 catches, 180 yards, and uh, one touchdown. So, um, uh, who are going to be the playmakers? Who's going to step up? Uh, that that is certainly something that you know. Buffalo hopefully will know a little bit more uh, once we get deeper in uh, to spring. Uh, but right now, you know, there there's not a ton uh, of, of known uh, commodities there, uh, especially on the offensive side of the ball at the skill positions. The offensive line is in a little bit better shape. Um, and, you know, we will see uh, somebody like Tashi Johnson, a wide receiver transfer coming in from Boston College, will he have an opportunity to, uh, you know, step up his level of production by dropping down, uh, you know, from a, a power conference to a spot like Buffalo that has utilized that type of, uh, you know, P5 transfer in the past at wide receiver specifically, uh, Preston Daniel. And uh, tight end may factor in as uh, a starter as well, but um, at least as of right now, the offensive line looks to be in, in decent shape. So perhaps that's something that Limbo and his coaching staff will be able to build around. Um, you know, only one full-time starter is gone. That's Gabe Wallace, uh, who, who split his time at, at tackle and guard on the left side of the offensive line. Actually played all over, played over 100 snaps at right tackle as well. So, you know, pretty <laughs> versatile offensive lineman uh, is gone. But four or three full-time starters are back, and then two other starters uh, who you know had uh, at least three uh, starts last season. So you know that offensive line group can build a little bit of a foundation there. Do get you know Fuqua, as we mentioned, who was fourth on the team last season in tackles. Uh, Red Murdoch at linebacker really performed well as a freshman last year. Uh, he was third on the team in tackles. Dion Crawford, fellow freshman, uh, was six on the team in tackles. So those three are back um, in, in that secondary. You know, filling out that group uh, should be a, a bit of a strength as well. But the schedule is uh, tough to start you know certainly uh, after you get the fbs opponent uh, lafayette you you would expect buffalo to be able to take care of business there the trip to missouri that you can probably pencil that in as an automatic loss missouri is is you know going to be top 15 in our preseason power rankings i expect might be a top 10 team in the ap poll um so probably going to lose that one there uh, future Mac rival UMass in week three. That game is, is going to be at UB Stadium in Buffalo. And then Mac play starts at Northern Illinois, another team with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, players that they're going to have to replace, especially at the quarterback position, a little bit of a, uh, you know, question mark there this year. Um, and then at UConn. To finish out non-conference play, they get a week off before hosting Toledo, who, despite all the turnover, is going to be still, I imagine, in the mix as uh, one of the MAC uh, championship contenders. They also host Western Michigan in mid-October. Back-to-back trips to Ohio and Akron before the uh, you know annual week off ahead of MACTION really getting up and running uh, in November. Buffalo will host Ball State on a Tuesday night. November 12th. They will travel to Eastern Michigan on a Wednesday and then host Kent State for the regular season finale on Tuesday of Thanksgiving week uh, next uh, next uh, November. So uh, Buffalo, there are, you know, winnable games on the schedule as always. Any MAC team we're going to talk about um, is going to be able to meet beat potentially any other MAC team. Yeah. You know, Toledo, Miami, uh, maybe even a, a Bowling Green, I think we're going to be probably uh, pretty high on this year. Ohio is always a, a dangerous team, even though they've got to replace a lot of their key pieces. Um, even those teams who are, who are probably you know going to be uh, among the favorites in the preseason. A, a team like Buffalo, you know, the, the talent gap is not that much different. Uh, if Pete Lambeau is going to be able to come in and, and you know, steal uh, a touchdown here or there with a big special teams play, uh, if, if he's able to, you know, turn to Agbana and, and kind of uh, build an offense around him that really utilizes his uh, running ability, uh, if they're able to uh, get 
you know, that offensive line to, you know, step up and, and really lead that offense. Uh, and maybe a surprise playmaker or two emerges uh, elsewhere. Uh, I don't think it's a, you know, crazy to think that despite things really, really trending in the wrong direction the last few years. Buffalo has the potential uh, to be a very competitive team in the MAC this year. Um, it's too early to say where they're going to stack up in, in our you know roster strength numbers and, and things like that. But uh, last year, defensively, you know, Buffalo finished the season 55th uh, in our, our you know roster numbers. And, and that's uh, there. There's definitely, you know, some key, uh, players to be able to build around, like Wolo, we mentioned, like Fuqua, that uh, make me think that um, you know they're they're probably not going to uh, fall too far this year. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if if you know Buffalo's still in the double digits. We'll say in defensive roster strength coming to last year. Offense, yeah, probably a different story. Uh, they were 118th. Uh, last year at, at the end of the season, and and there might be you know a, a couple of spots uh, lower where they'll start this year, but um, I don't know. I'm I'm somewhat optimistic. We'll see, of course, how it all shakes out and what we're able to learn about Buffalo uh, this spring. But that is going to wrap it up for us today. Uh, again, I am Nicholas Ian Allen of CFB Winning Edge and CampusCanton.com. We very much appreciate your support. Uh, giving us a like on this video is incredibly helpful. Uh, subscribing to the Campus Canton YouTube channel, we very much appreciate if you're willing to do that. And if you want to give us a try as a member at CampusCanton.com, you can do so for as little as $2.99 per month or uh, you know, join us at the CFC, uh, CFC, C2C winning edge uh, or all 22 tiers uh, where I'm going to be right after this dropping that database of offensive line performance and our current returning production numbers uh, just in a nice, neat little uh, package. So you'll be able to, to take that and, and use it for what you like uh, in our uh, C2C winning edge tier channels there. So uh, do check us out. Uh, do you know send any feedback. If, if you've got something that you think that we are uh, incorrect on, like I said, at the top of the show, those, you know, Florida State returning uh, or, or, you know, uh, roster strength numbers on the defensive side of the ball, uh, I should have mentioned, you know, probably a little low based on, on uh, uh, where our rankings are, just where we are in the process as far as getting those numbers updated for 2024. Um, so, Always appreciate that. Always appreciate it. if you notice something that that needs our attention uh, in our team profiles or returning production database, or just you know you want to pass along a, a bit of news that we might have overlooked uh, from somewhere this spring. We're very appreciative of that as well. So uh, that again will wrap it up for us today. Have a wonderful Wednesday. We will be back on Friday for episode twenty-eight of Good Morning College Football.